Hello, everyone. This is criminal profiler Pat Brown, <laughs> and I'm, I'm already laughing over a serious show because we have a lot of people in the chat room who are, are making terrible puns uh, because of this case. Uh, it's one of those cases you can be pretty punny about. Oh, yes, you can. And, uh, of course, I started the whole thing because my title for the show is Lizzie Borden, if you ask me a profiler's opinion. Um, well, I live in Prince George's County, Maryland, and a lot of people ask me a lot of things. It's just uh, it's just a colloquialism. It's a it's a way of speaking, and I do say ask myself, but a lot of people say ax. And so, if you ask me, I'm going to give you my answer today. And so, welcome to everybody who is in the chat room making funny funny sayings, uh, which I'm appreciating. Uh, hold on, I got to take my glasses off. I'm having a weird eye problem. It's like suddenly I don't need reading glasses, and it's like I don't know what to do about that. Um, I like my reading glasses, and I'm having trouble reading with them now because I don't need them. Go figure. All right. Beverly is here. Stephanie is here. Sarah is here. Loretta is here. Who else is in here? Uh, Jill is here. Benny is here. Um, and by the way, thank you, Benny. Benny sent me a great video. Uh, his opinion on the case. And Benny is a very logical person. And I love his viewpoints. And I won't tell you what his viewpoints are yet because I won't tell you whether I agree with them or not yet. All right. Texas Redhead is here. Kathy is here. Loretta is here. And this is Clarissa is here. Anna is here. Kurtz is here. Uh, let's see who else. Did I, I'm sorry, I didn't miss you. I'm sure. Met Wendy is here. Um, and now I start getting confused because there's so many names. So if I missed your name now, I feel bad. It's, oh, here's one more. Uh, Blue, Blue Bell is here. Um, and by the way, if you'd like to be in the chat room during my live shows, um, please do join. Join Patreon. It's in the link in the description below. Uh, it's five bucks a month. It supports this educational channel which is very important because I don't do a lot of things that are just the kind of stuff that gets a ton of viewers and it makes the YouTube algorithm happy. So <clears throat> supporting the channel at $5 a month is great, even if you don't come to the eight live shows. But if you do, you get two live shows a week, a uh, hangout and a case show, and it's a lot of fun. Hey, just subscribe to the channel. Please do that. Please do that. Subscribe to the channel. That also helps the algorithm. Like these videos. Click the bell for notifications. And um, there's a lot of other ways to support the channel below. Books, little dollar sign clicky things. All right. That's that. Let me get to this case. All right. So a lot of people had asked me to do more on Lizzie Borden. And I had, I had spoken up a little bit on Lizzie Borden. And I... Um, but I never did a whole full view of the case. And so I have done that now. Um, and there's a lot out there because pretty much everybody who has ever looked at crime loves this case. Um, it's one of those that's just spectacular and fascinating because a woman is accused of axing or hatcheting her, her parents to death, her father and a stepmother. Um, and she got off, but, that's where the argument, of course, comes in. Was she innocent or was she guilty? And so if you go to YouTube, you will find pretty much everybody who's ever done true crime has done something on this case. And I'm kind of late to the party, but it's all there. And you can also find um, uh, the movie uh, with Elizabeth Montgomery playing her. Oh, my God, that is so well done. The what's it called? The Tale of Lizzie Borden? Something like that. It's, uh, it's on YouTube for free, and it's also on Prime Video uh, if you have Prime Video at Amazon. And I think she did a spectacular job playing Lucy Borden. And of course they had the viewpoint in that particular movie that she was guilty. So yeah, there you go. Um, but there's other, there's been so much, so many documentaries, movies done about Lucy Borden. It's kind of crazy, but it, it's just one of those things. It's one of those historic crimes that has so much to look at. And so that's why I'm willing to look at it. So anyway, all right, getting toasty. All right, let's get this off. All right, I put my glasses back on because I still can't see it. Because <laughs> I usually present with my glasses on and I kind of like them because otherwise my face is like seriously bland because I can't do makeup. Anyway, so, <laughs> oh, let's see. Oh, um, oh, the Christina Ricci version. I forgot about that. I haven't seen that one yet. Her, it was filmed in my hometown 10 years ago. Haven't seen it yet. And I like Christina Ricci, so... Am I saying her name right? I do like her. Uh, she was from Married with Children, right? Was it that one? Yeah, I always thought she was great. Um, she's a good actress too. And um, I haven't seen that one yet, but I might have to watch it. Oh, thank you, Benny. You can see and hear me. You know, I did a whole 
a whole video the other day, 20 minute video, actually on the Maya Kowalski case. And it was totally blurry, the entire thing. I have no idea what went wrong. So you're not going to see that. <laughs> so thank you for telling me that because, mm, okay, this is a good question. I'm going to get to that. Uh, Texas Retta is saying to Loretta, no kidding. How did she do a quick change in those outfits? Because, you know, she wasn't found with any blood on her. So, and, she, and you're wearing the outfits of that day, which are like, not like this thing, <laughs> which, I mean, which I can't even put on right. Um, it's not <laughs> a shirt from Amazon um, that you can whip in and out of. You're talking about this kind of thing. You know, what women wore, which was too much work. So that is a very good question. And I'm going to get to all of that. But let me first just read to the folks who don't have a clue who Lizzie Borton was. Because if you, you know, first of all, a lot of people have heard the vague just vaguely about her, but don't really know the story. And there are other people from other countries who have no clue who Lizzie Borden is. So Lizzie Borden, Lizzie Andrew Borden, it's a weird middle name. <laughs> Maybe that's what drove her to this crime. <laughs> oh my God, what a strange middle name for a woman. All right, Lizzie Andrew Borden was an American woman who was tried and acquitted uh, of the August 4th, 198, I'm sorry, 1892 axe murders or hatchet murders, depending on what you want to call this, um, that they aren't even absolutely sure is the weapon, okay, because they don't. That's one of the reasons I think she got off, because they weren't sure about that weapon. Um, the 1892 axe murders of her father and stepmother in Fall River, Massachusetts. And by the way, if you go up to Boston, uh, you can go you can go stay at this particular house, um, because I've made it a place where they do, you know, the mystery stuff and the Lizzie Borden stuff. And you can stay in one of the rooms and I don't know if it's whose room it is or whether you get murdered there, but it's one of those, you know, his, historic mystery houses. Um, so if you go to Boston, eh, something to do. Um, no one was charged in the murders. No one else was charged in the murders. She got off. Uh, she was found, she was acquitted, not found, found not guilty. And uh, after that, no one else was charged in the murders. And, it claims here, and despite ostracism from other residents, and I want to get into some of the issues of the relationships in the community with Lizzie Borden, the relationships with Lizzie and her parents and all of this stuff, because this becomes uh, almost a sideshow to the evidence. And I and people get too involved in it, and and it, I think it sends them off course. Um, but after, after uh, she got... Uh, uh, um, found not guilty. Um, she says she, despite ostracism, although she seemed like she was having a pretty fine time, she spent the remainder of her life in Fall River. So she didn't move away. Um, she died of pneumonia at the age of 66, just days before the death of her older sister, Emma, who was 10 years older and not really, they weren't living together. So no, no relation there on their deaths, except they just happened to die close in time. All right. So the Borden murders and trial received widespread publicity throughout the United States. Along with Borden herself, they remain a topic in American popular culture to the present day. They have been, de they have been de depicted in numerous films, theatrical productions, literary works, and folk rhymes. They're still well known in the Fall River area. Now, the, the folk rhyme, which, of course, everybody who probably grew up in the United States definitely knows, is the basic one. Lizzie Borden took an axe, gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, gave her father 41. I think you're supposed to do that with the jump rope. <laughs> Although I was never, I can't get my clothes on to do that. Sorry. <laughs> Don't I wish I could edit. Anyway, um, you know, that's what you, <laughs> I think that was it. Lizzie Borden took an axe, gave her mother 40 wax. When she see what she, <laughs> wait, my blur. When she saw what she had done, gave her father 41. Yeah, I think that that was definitely a thing. But did you know this is the second verse? And I did not know this. Andrew Borden now is dead. Lizzie hit him on the head. Up in heaven he will sing. On the gallows she will swing. <laughs> I, I've never heard the second part of that. So I thought that was kind of interesting. So apparently at the time and, and a lot into the future, people thought she was guilty of this crime um, in spite of the fact she was found not guilty. So what, what does one look at when one looks at a, an historic crime like this um, and tries to determine what is the most likely thing to have happened? And this is one of these crimes where, to me, there are a few things that stand out, absolutely stand out to me, 
that tell me whether she is guilty or innocent. And I'm trying to think how many of these are noted by others. Um, I think this is some, I think two out of three are pretty much skipped by other people, but um, that's why I really want to talk about this case because it's, it's really interesting for that reason. All right. All right. So let me check here some of your comments here as I go on to tell the, tell the basic story of this. Um, yeah. Never knew there was a second verse. Yeah. I mean, surprise, surprise. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure somebody has written their thesis on impro inappropriate children's rhymes. Let, let's face it. Um, children's rhymes forever have been highly inappropriate. You know, rock a -bye baby in a tree top went in a tree top. When the bell breaks, the baby, falls, the baby's falling out of a tree top. And I mean, who writes stuff like that? Some of our fairy tales are pretty evil too. I mean, they're really cruel. So I'm like some sadistic adults out there, but anyway, <laughs> Let's get to the story. So we have, all right, what do we have here? Let me give you just the, I have to take my glasses off. God, I don't know what's going wrong here. It's craziness. Anyway, uh, so let me go to the basic setup for the family situation. Okay. So let's see if I got it here straight. All right. So Lizzie, Lizzie lived with her dad right? Who was near 70. This is her sister. Okay. Emma. Emma was 10 years older. And this is her stepmother, Abby. Um, now, uh, the mother of Emma and, and uh, Lizzie died when Lizzie was two and Emma was 12. So Emma knew her mother well, and Lizzie really never met her. Um, well, she met her, but she didn't remember her. Um, she must have met her because she came out of her and she hung around for two years. But, you know, she didn't remember her. And then he remarried this woman. And essentially, this stepmother raised uh, Lizzie from the time she was two. Or I forgot how, well, I forgot when he exactly married her. Okay, maybe not quite two, but uh, she grew up with her. Supposedly, at one point, she did call her mother. And then eventually, she stopped calling her that and called her Mrs. Borden because she supposedly had there was a, like a rift between them um and abby is an interesting character in all of this because she she it is said that she was kind of a mother to lizzie and and protected her and sort of raised her w when she was really not so into it now this is the beginning of stories and i think this is important to understand I, I started reading a whole bunch of stuff and it was just impossible to tell how much of the stories were true and how much was somebody's opinion and somebody's opinion after the trial and somebody's opinion before the trial. It was very difficult because first of all, these two are dead, so they can't even discuss things. Abby, um, Abby seemed to support her sister, but also seemed to have a strain, a little bit of a distance from her at the same time. Um, and I'll get to what happened with their relationship later, which I think is fascinating. So they lived in this house. Let me show you the house they lived in again. This is the house they lived in. This becomes another story. So the story about this is that this house, uh, that daddy had a lot of money. Daddy was a very successful man in business and uh, in, in real estate. And he had a crap load of money. I mean, like in the millions. So and that's back in that what we millions today, not in that day, but in millions of today's today's, uh, you know, equivalency of money. But they lived in this house. Now, one looks at this house and says, not so bad. But apparently. This is the claim that Lizzie thought they should have lived in a much fancier home in a fancier part of town now. And that and then this is where the story goes, that the daddy was a miser, that instead of having things that they could have fancier ba uh, in, uh, inside bathrooms and fancier lighting systems. He had only more basic stuff and that he never, he gave his daughters an allowance, but it wasn't so great. So that essentially they lived a, a middle-class life instead of a wealthy life. Now, some of that is highly exaggerated, supposedly that actually they did have reasonable amenities in this house. They ate very well. It seems to me um, they did have a, uh, they did have a live-in maid. Uh, so she did 
she didn't clean the people's bedroom, the family's bedroom, but she did a lot of the cleaning of the house. So he did provide that. Uh, could he have provided more for his family? Could he have moved to the richer area of town? Could he have gotten a fancy house and been part of top of, top of society? He could have, but maybe that just wasn't who he was. And he was satisfied with his more middle-class life, a well, a well enough, uh, perfectly fine life in his opinion. Uh, and his daughters did not work. They did a lot. She did a lot of charity work, tremendous amount of charity work. So some people said, oh, she was just living off her daddy. But I mean, quite frankly, she didn't have to go do a job that a woman of her status might not want to do. So she actually had money to go and, and be do volunteer work and all that stuff. So I don't know that her life was so bad and her father was so evil. And I think when when things are presented late years later, God knows what they say about you. I'm pretty sure that when I leave this earth, if anybody remembers who the heck I am and for some reason wants to talk about me, <laughs> they're going to say all kinds of things that may not be true. How my relationships are with my family, uh, how, well, how I did things. There's going to be a ton of versions. The problem is, does it matter in this case? And my opinion is it does not. Now, there's another story that is pertinent to this case, which is also questionable. Um, supposedly, she, lo she loved animals. I think there's no doubt about that because after her parents were no longer in the picture, she did have dogs and um, she did love animals and she left a crap load of money to the anim like, like, uh, Animal Protection Society. I mean, like a huge amount of money. And so she seemed to love animals, which is kind of interesting if she's a killer. Uh, but suppose this story, this is the story that, is told a lot as to one of her motives for this crime and, and the methodology of the crime, that supposedly she had pigeons. She had pigeons she kept in the barn. And supposedly one day there were these kids who kept trying to break into the barn to steal the pigeons or something like that. So one day daddy got pissed off and he ran up into the barn and, and took the hatchet and hacked off the heads of her pigeons. And that is in the Elizabeth uh, Montgomery version of the story and she's like oh she's crying because she's uh, she's killing all my pigeons and i'm and i have a little bit of sympathy because i have owned pigeons myself and doves so <laughs> I'm, i also would be very upset if somebody cut the heads off my pigeons so but did this even happen and according to her actual testimony on it i don't think it did happen there was a situation where supposedly the dad brought some pigeons to her and the heads, some of the heads have been twisted, as one does when one's killing birds for just food. And, and a couple were apparently missing. I don't know because he did that number. Uh, but she just talked, she didn't talk about them as though they were her pets, more like they were going to be dinner because pigeons make perfectly delicious uh, dinner. And um, if you go, if you go to um, Morocco, which I've been to, they make a thing called bestia there which is a flaky pastry with eggs and almonds and pigeon. They have these huge towers in, in, uh, where they ra raise pigeons and kill them for bestia. Um, and, you know, pigeons similar to chicken, but a slightly different flavor and quite, quite tasty. And um, so she didn't seem to be saying that they were pet pigeons. That's just that they were pigeons and they were in her kitchen. So I'm going to say they ate them. Um, so this story is one of those things that's passed along as motive that she hated her father for killing her pigeons. She hated her father for being a cheapskate. She hated her father for uh, chopping up her pigeons with theoretically a hatchet or an ax. And therefore she came back at him with this rage killing to chop him up because of that. She also supposedly hated her stepmother and that's why she called him Mrs. Borden. Um, but it's hard to say what the issue was with the stepmother. I mean, stepmothers, you know, we often have to hear about the stepmother stories. Um, but it's hard to know whether, whether she hated her stepmother because her stepmother was an evil stepmother or the stepmother didn't particularly like her because she was a psychopath. And I don't know. I wasn't there. Can't say. Don't know. But was there maybe no love lost? Perhaps. But what was the motive for killing the, the stepmother? And that would be a question. Now, so we have this situation where, oh, then we have, we have another one that people put in there as well, that her father committed incest with, with, uh, with Lizzie. And there's, that's one reason she hated him because 
they had an incestuous relationship. She'd been raped by him over and over, whatever, whatever. And therefore she wanted to take him down. There is zero proof of that. So again, this is, this is stuff that's interjected into the story, makes it a, the, you know, the idea of giving her motive, enough motive that you actually kind of are on a side, like your daddy killed your pigeons. Your daddy molested you or raped you. Your stepmother was an evil stepmother. Well, I want to help you out. <laughs> You know, and makes you feel for her in some way that makes you feel like, oh, okay, if she actually did it. I, she shouldn't have done it, but I kind of see why she did it. And I think this is a lot of things that have been uh, proposed in, in this story. And in my opinion, most of that is not verifiable to any level that I can say that has anything to do with the exact murder itself or that it proves she murdered her or didn't, uh, mur murdered her parents or didn't murder her parents. Their stories. They're interesting, but I would have to spend years trying to go through every witness account to see if the witnesses had validity and whether they all agreed with each other or whether they didn't. There are people that say she was totally unhappy in the town, that nobody paid any attention to her. And then there's stories where she's busy, busy, busy doing all kinds of things. The same thing after the parents have been murdered. There are those who say she was ostracized, but she was having, she was giving parties. You know? So was she ostracized by everyone? Or is she just kind of different? So she had a, a smaller group of friends. Maybe she wasn't popular with a certain group of people. Maybe people just were, you know, wondering whether she still did it or not. And they stepped back. But, you know, it wasn't because of her personality. It was because of the murders. Was What was it? And I do not know. And I won't base any conclusions on stuff I haven't got a clue about. So let me check your, uh, so I'm going to check your comments on that, the basic story issue, and then I'm going to get to the actual crime itself and who are the suspects. All right. So, uh, they, they do know who died first. The, the stepmother died before the, 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 the father. And that's because of, uh, there's, there's a lot of reasons for that, but we absolutely know the stepmother died first, almost an hour and a half to two hours before the father. And that's extremely important in all of this. So anyway, okay. Ooh, see that now, now I'm, now I'm sweating and my glasses are fogging. All right, let me go to who was at the house because this is important. And there's this guy by the name of Morse. All right, so at the house, at the time that all of this went down, here we have, we have Lizzie. Oh, you might say, what happened to Abby? Okay, we definitely know these two were at the house because they got murdered and their bodies were there. <laughs> they got murdered at the house at different times. Um, this, the sister... Uh, actually was away. She was away visiting in another town. She is not a part of this, the murders at all. And of course, some people say, well, she helped plan it, but she left town purposely. Now, come on now. She just left town, which gave an opportunity for there to be less persons in the house to see what was going on. So she's not there. She's not involved. Okay. So let's go to the other people in the house. You have Lizzie. We have the maid. Okay. And uh, the, the maid becomes very important. Um, Maggie Sullivan, um, um, I forgot her real name now. Uh, <laughs> they call her by two different names. So it always gets me confused. Okay, what's the other name they call her? Um, sorry, I'm just, I, I'm blanking here. Okay, come on now, what's her real name? Okay. <sighs> Why am I forgetting her real name? Somebody, somebody got a real name for me. <laughs> they called her Maggie, but that, that wasn't her real name. Um, I'm just blanking. Somebody tell me. Bridget. Thank you very much, Bridget. <laughs> Hard to keep track of all the things in your head. Yes, Bridget. This is Bridget Sullivan, but they called her Maggie. I'm going to call her Bridget from now on because it gets confusing. Bridget, that's her legal name. Oh, and they asked her who calls her Maggie, and she said it was just Lizzie and Abby, and I don't know why they called her that. Maybe that was a, you know, uh, informal name she liked for people that were closer to her, which the two girls were closer to her age than were the people who hired her, you know, the Bordens that, that hired her. So, so she, but her name was Bridget, and and so we have Lizzie in the house that day. We have Bridget in the house that day. Both of them were there the entire time. And this is important to remember. This isn't a case of they went out and came back and went out and came back. No, no. They were there the entire time. Abby, the sister, was out of town. That only leaves one other guy. And this guy's name is Morse. He is her some maternal uncle. 
maternal uncle who came by and they think he's a kind of a, a weird fellow and had some issues with Andrew uh, uh, Borden. Uh, and, but he, he had come by and stayed in the house prior to this time. And he came the night before and stayed in the house, okay, in the guest room. And in the morning, he got up and had breakfast uh, with, with the Bordens. Uh, and then he went off and visited other people, took some trolleys or whatever he took. And people say, oh, his, 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 ver his uh, alibi is too slick, too perfect, too whatever. We believe he had something to do with it. Well, first of all, he hadn't even seen Lizzie and I don't know how long or anybody else. So he, it certainly wasn't a conspiracy. So if he killed the Bordens, he would have had to leave the house, somehow get this perfect alibis. In other words, people he visited and the fact he was had trolley tickets and stuff and sneak back into the house while these two were there, sneak all the way around the house, managed to kill first the stepmother upstairs. And then after he, he, he hacked her to death with the, with the ax or the hatchet, um, then another hour, hour and a half passed where was he? Was he hiding in the house waiting for the, for the, for Mr. Borden to come home? And then when these two are still walking all over the house, somehow he snuck out and whack, whack, whack as soon as they were out of the room and then took off <laughs> and then came back. I mean, it's ludicrous. It's just flaming ludicrous. So him, I'll put the big, I can't do it. Can't do an X. I mean, <laughs> big X. It's just one of those things people want to have an alternative theory and it's, it sucks. He's out of the picture. Didn't happen. So now let's get to who is actually at the house when this goes down. And this is where the problems come in. Okay. So it's the two ladies. All right. So I will put my glasses on, see if I can check out what you're saying and see if that helps. Um, Oh, uh, we're talking about uh, talking about um, how how the um, th this is this is important only in a certain sense at the moment. She came to the United States. She is Irish. Her parents were dead. She seemed to have no relatives. Came to the United States, I think, like six years prior to this. Got this job a couple years prior to the murders. Um, I'm sure she wasn't making a whole boatload of money. And this is important. OK, I'm sure she wasn't overly thrilled with her job. I mean, people like to believe that everybody just has such a delightful time cleaning all day long. And, you know, sometimes like in this day and age, mind you, uh, in, in the United States, for example, I pay somebody to come to clean my house and it's expensive. I mean, it, it's they make more money cleaning my house per hour than I make doing YouTube, <laughs> you know, but I hate cleaning. So I'm OK. They do a great job. They're lovely people. I'm, I'm fine with it. If I live in India. I can pay the entire month the same amount I pay the ladies to come to my house for one hour. Pay the entire month for somebody. And if after that entire month is over, which happened one time when I was in India, I, I, I the month was over. They had servants in the house. People I was staying with just had seven or eight servants. And I was told, why don't you give the woman a tip? And I said, well, what should I give her? And they told me $10, which I didn't think was a whole lot for a month. But I gave her $10 and she prostrated herself at my feet, laid down flat on the floor. And I'm like, wow, because for her, it was a lot of money. So <laughs> there's a difference when she was doing the work. She was she was probably not having the best life. She worked probably worked pretty hard doing a lot of cleaning and washing and all the stuff she's doing. She did get a room to stay in. I don't know how they treated her. I don't know whether the Bordens treated her well or they didn't, but she'd already been in the country six years she, and she's a cleaning lady. And she's, a, you know, and there's nothing wrong with being a cleaning lady, but one that probably doesn't make a great deal of money and doesn't have a lot of great opportunities in life. She probably isn't saving up a lot of money, although she did have a place to stay. So I don't know what they exactly paid her, but I'm going to say she wouldn't mind doing better and keep that in mind. So, um, Okay, An Annika says, hi, uh, it wasn't Bridget, she'd lose her job. Well, she killed both of them, she would definitely lose her job. And if she was going to angrily hack at somebody, it would be the horrible daughters, horrible to her anyway. I don't know that the daughters treated her horribly. I don't know if the Bordens, the Mr. and Mrs. Borden treated her horribly. Do I believe she attacked the Bordens with a, an ax? No, I do not. So I'll get into why I think that it's 
<laughs> Sylvain says, you may need to get your eyes checked, Pat. I've got cataracts early stage. You may need to find new glasses. <laughs> In the middle of talking about this, answer to that is yes. My glasses were great for four years and suddenly I can see close, but not as far, far away. So yes, it may be the beginning of cataracts. My eyes were checked. My, they say I do not have cataracts, although it could be that. They actually said my eyes look great. I'm like, but <laughs> there's some reason for this, but I'm 68. So I'm going to say in five years, six, seven years, I may be doing that cataract surgery. You're right. Anyway, a little aside. Anyway, <laughs> oh my goodness. All right. So these two are in the house and here's where I want to start the story. All right. So what happens in this house and why do I think the number one reason why one of the reasons why it is very likely that uh, Lizzie is guilty of killing both of her parents is because they were the only people in the house except for the two people who died. <laughs> okay. Nobody else there. And the concept that anybody would come into the house and, and the stepmother was killed upstairs. Let me show you a, a little a little picture of the house. It's a very weird place, um, actually. Um, it's, it was once like a, a split split house, like like a like a, like two two. It had like had two separate houses originally, and so they combined the houses, but they didn't combine the houses in a very normal way. In other words, there's no break between the walls. They didn't like open it up. This is a second floor. I'm sorry. This is the first floor. This is a second floor, but here's the problem. Um, the When you come up these stairs, see here, you, you come up here and then you have this room, which is the guest room, all right? And that is where uh, the stepmother was actually found murdered. That was where Morse was staying until he left that morning. And she was cleaning, she was in there doing some, uh, supposedly changing some sheets and putting some pillowcases, whatever she's doing. And she was killed in this room, right at the top of the landing here. Okay. Now, right next door is Lizzie's room. And you might wonder what, what the heck, you know, there's a, like a doorway. No, they, the door was, was bolted shut. And there was a, there was like a heavy piece of furniture blocking the two rooms so that the guests couldn't sneak in. Now you also see that it seems like you have to go through Lizzie's room to get to, to uh, Emma's room, which that appears to be true. But then you go up here and you see over here, that is Mr. and Mrs. Borden's room here. And, there is a door between the two of them, but again, that was bolted. That was, that was, they, Mr. Borden bolted that at night and he kept the key with him. He apparently didn't either didn't trust Lizzie or didn't want her to sneak looking in on them and all that kind of crap. So, so that was bolted at night. Some people ask why, if she did the crime, didn't she just kill them at night? Well, because you couldn't get into the room and there was another door here, but he, he was paranoid. So he bolted a lot of crap at night. So I think he bolted themselves in there. So she couldn't get in at night. Now, how do you get to this room is weird. So what happens is you, you can't, you can't, you can't, let's see, you can't just go up the stairs and go there. So what you have to do is you have to go through the bottom of the house to the back stairs and then go over to their room. So it's, it's a weird setup, but, 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 uh, the, uh, Mrs. Uh, Borden was killed here. Abby, um, sorry, what's her name? Her name. Uh, Mrs. Borden was killed here. Okay. And so it was just somebody came up the stairs and could easily chop, chop her up. Um, now, the father was killed in the sitting room, which is fairly close. You come in the door and you, you don't go into the parlor because it's too fancy. You go in here and you sit down on a couch and rest. Mm -hmm. So I'll show you. Th this is this is a very modified. Oops, oh, those are guys who that's the guys who found her innocent or not guilty. And, you know, it's an all male jury. Women weren't allowed on the jury. But within one hour, actually, they said 10 minutes, they found her not guilty, but they waited an hour so they looked like they were thinking. But I just don't know if they couldn't believe a woman did it or they didn't think there was enough evidence or whatever, but they found her not guilty. Um, let me find a picture of, is that missing? Hold on a second. Okay, that's a picture. I very carefully cut out anything that makes YouTube unhappy. So this is basically him like laying on a couch. That's his, that's his hand. He's just laying on the couch. He's come home. He's, he's relaxed. He's laying on the couch. His head is here. He's got a coat underneath his head. Now, he's got shoes on, and this will become important. And this is, this is Mrs. Borden, who's just lying sort of on the floor, sort of half under the bed. 
So that's what happened to them. Now, let's go back to the ladies. So what we have, wait a minute, this is the wrong lady. Wait a minute, I've got the wrong lady. Oh, not her sister. Her sister's out of town. All right. So the problem is this. Somebody, if these two were home and were always at home, and one of the interesting things you'll see in the descriptions, if I've, I've looked, I'll, I'll link below the uh, all the um, all the court stuff and the, and the inquest stuff, so you can read what they have to say. And one thing that they say is that they move around this house a lot, a lot. We're not talking that they were both like in, uh, ill and they're both in their rooms for eight hours straight. And they never left their rooms because they were sick. That's not what happened. Both of them were moving around. She was moving around. She was washing windows. She was going from here to there all over the house. She was all over the house. She's up and down. She's ironing. Apparently she can't, she, she has a problem with her iron. She can never get the iron hot. So <laughs> that's a whole other story about how she keeps saying she's ironing, but the iron isn't hot enough. So she keeps leaving and she's all over the house. She's in the kitchen. She's in the basement. She, she's everywhere. She's everywhere. You think some guy's got women just rolling all over the house because somehow, and they like to bolt the doors too. So supposedly there was a thing about them locking up the house when, you know, there was people were out of it. I guess so nobody could come in. So how did somebody get in the house? How did somebody manage to get by both women, go upstairs to, to the, uh, to the sit, the, uh, guest room, kill off, um, kill, kill off, uh, Mrs. Borden first. Now, one of the most interesting things about this as far as, and this is the second thing, which I think is very important. You talk about how there's only two people in the house and they're all over the place. How could somebody get away with this without them seeing, right? Which is pretty weird that they would kill Mrs. Borden and then some, where are they for an hour and a half before the father comes home or an hour or whatever? Where is he? Is he hiding in the bottom and waiting for the father to be alone when there's two women running in and out of rooms? He just suddenly finds that Five minute opportunity runs in, hacks him up and runs out the front door, leaving no bl blood trail. OK, that's highly unlikely. But the weirdest thing here, and this is one of the number number two issues I have. The door to her room was left open. Now, if you are killing somebody and you want to wait around for the. The uh, spouse to come home because you want both of them dead and, and it also Quite frankly, if it was a business part, some people say, oh, well, she was uh, Lizzie tried to claim one. Or, she has some issues with the business partners. I'm sorry. Her father had issues with a business partner or business people, not even a partner, just business people. So he so the business person wants to kill the father, but he comes in and sneaks all the way upstairs and kills the wife for no reason whatsoever. So that makes no sense. Um, I'm sure if he, somebody wanted to kill Andrew Borden, he, they'd find a way to do it just with him. They could kill him on the doorstep. They didn't need to go up and kill the wife. With people at home, and how did they get into the house? But okay, here now the person has hacked her to death. The door to her room was left open. When the police got there, eventually, the doctor got there, the police got there, even, even, uh, even these two ladies... They both say the door to her room was open. Would somebody like to comment what the problem I have with that is? Um, so I, I do want to, oh, you said that? Oh, touring the house makes it clear there's no way someone other than Lizzie did it. That's interesting. What do you think I have a problem with the open door? What is the biggest problem with the open door? Somebody? What's your thoughts on that? Because that's a huge clue, in my opinion. Well, yes, you can you can see the bot. Wait a minute. Uh, wait a minute. Where is it? I'm, okay. Um, wait a minute. Hold on. You can see the body from the stairs. Indeed, you can. What's the problem with that? Ah, thank you, Texas Redhead. Not worrying someone else will see the body. Hmm, indeed. Just think about this. So here I am. I'm Mr. Axeman because it's not these two ladies. I'm Mr. Axeman. I've gone up and chop, chop, chop. And now I'm going to wait for Mr. Borden to come home. Wouldn't I want to close the door so no one would see the body? Because if they went by the room as these women were running everywhere in that dang house, and it's, it's, the, the room is right next to her room. 
It's right at the top of the stairs. You can see it from the top of the stairs. Anybody going up the stairs would see this, the, the, the body in the room. Why wouldn't they want nobody to see that? Otherwise, they'd run away and call the police and they wouldn't be able to kill Mr. Borden. So who, somebody left the door open without concern. So what the heck? They both. OK, wait a minute. Wait a minute. But Benny says they both knew she was dead long before Andrew came home. And whoever killed her wasn't worried about anybody else knowing she was dead. What does that tell you about her? Because she was all over the house. Oh, where didn't you hear one puzzle? Wouldn't you hear screaming? Well, it depends how quickly you hit them and they didn't get a chance to scream, but you would hear a thump, 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 possibly. Yes, you would. Um, oh, that's the point. Mrs. Borden was a heavy woman. That body hitting the floor would be heard from somewhere in the house. That could be true, too. Um, <laughs> uh -huh. Bridget was outside doing the windows, and the doors were locked from inside because Dad wanted them because uh, of earlier burglary. All right. I'll get into the whole window washing issue. But the fact is, she wasn't locked out of the house permanently. She was just outside. She did come in. She came in before the father came home. And when she came in before the father came home, where was she walking around the house? What's the problem with this? Sounds like she was in on it. Well, she may not be the killer. But the fact that she did not, if she committed this crime, have any concern that Bridget would see the dead stepmother. Or, or if she's running around the house cleaning up, getting rid of the bloody dress, doing whatever she's doing, Bridget's there. Then you could say she's outside, she's here, she's there. But she, if you listen to her statement, she was in and out of that house and, and, and moved around quite a lot. She was out for a while washing the windows, and I'll get into that. All right. The window story is what Lizzie and Bridget claim. Yes and no. She was outside washing windows. That has been proven by witnesses. And I did check that out for the same exact reason. However, how long she was out washing the windows is another question. And when things happen is another question. Um, okay. Complicit. Lila says, offer of dollars afterwards as the father was so cheap. I don't know how cheap the father was again. Um, so I'm not going to say daddy was, <laughs> but probably wasn't the greatest salary. However, after she was acquitted, she moved away. She got a sum of money that allowed her to buy a farm in Ireland. And then when that didn't work out for her, she moved, she came back to the U.S. and moved to Montana and married out there. And they said she wasn't exactly poor. This is a woman who was a, who was a servant. How did she go from being a servant to being able to buy a farm right away? And supposedly, yes, she did give her money. And there's some claims that the two were in a lesbian relationship. I don't know if that's true or not. Could be. She never married. She she was she hung around people and, and uh, later in uh, uh, in in the theater. She, she could easily be gay. That's an, not a big deal. She could easily be gay. She married a man eventually, but that doesn't mean anything. So they could have had a relationship, a romantic relationship, or she just was happy to get some money so she wouldn't have to be a servant any longer. And she was happy to say, hey, shut up, help me out here, and you don't have to do this work anymore. Hmm. We will never know, but that's interesting. So yeah, essentially hush money. Okay, so now... I want to point out something, other things that I find extremely interesting. Now, so, so the first person gets killed is her stepmother. Now, the whole thing that comes down to the biggest motive here is that the father was 70, getting close to maybe an age where he wasn't going to be around much longer, and supposedly may have written a will or maybe hadn't gotten around to writing a will. But she was, there was some concern on her part, so, it, so people say, that the money was going to go to go to the spouse and she was going to be out getting much and she kind of wanted she kind of wanted more let's put it this way she was there's evidence that she had some odd behavior she she was known to be a shoplifter 
and she didn't need to shoplift. So she obviously did that because she got the thrill out of it. She had a very cold kind of personality. Um, when she found her father, she's like, oh, dad's dead. She didn't she's like scream and go crying and all that stuff. So I'm not saying you have to, but apparently she, she exhibited a lot of a lack of empathy, a lack of remorse if she did this, a lack of a whole lot of things. She, in my opinion, if you go to Dr. Grande's uh, show, it's kind of interesting. He actually says she's not a psychopath. She, he, she, she scores about zero on that. I'm like, I'm going to totally disagree. Interesting methodology that he used on that, but I totally disagree. I think she exhibits probably a good deal of psychopathy. So if she didn't, she was getting older and she wasn't that thrilled with her lifestyle. Her father held all the cards, essentially the money. And if, if that money didn't go to her, she would end up having a mediocre life forever after. And she might have seen this was the one opportunity she had to deal with this. And she couldn't allow the money to go to the spouse. So the first person has to die because the way the whole thing was written is that um, it depends who dies first. If, if, if uh, the father died first, the money go to the spouse and that spouse died. Some of that money might go to her family. But if the spouse dies first, the, fem the, the wife, then Andrew's money would not go to her. So she dies first, then he dies she and her sister get all the money. So she, she's a good card player. You know what I'm saying? So in my opinion. So the idea was get rid of the stepmother first and then get rid of daddy. And then if she gets away with it, she gets the money. Now, it's a hell of a game to play because she, she couldn't know she was going to get away with it. But she because of her shoplifting stuff, she kind of exhibits that inability to necessarily look toward the future and see what the consequences will be. In other words, if it means something to her to get do it, makes her feel good she's going to do it. That to me is a high, as a, one of the signs of a psychopathy, is that you can't look, you don't look into the future and say, you know, this is a bad idea. <laughs> this is, I'm going to end up in jail for doing this. Um, she knew where she was at, and she didn't like where she was at, so she did this thing and got away with it. She and she and she might thought she was clever enough to get away with it. She might be right. She got away with it, in my opinion. So she thinks she can commit this crime as long as she can get rid of nobody rats her out and she can get rid of the clothes and the, and the weapon. She's good to go. And she, and she apparently she was correct because she could present herself as a female who couldn't do these things. And interestingly enough, neither she nor Bridget stated anything about seeing anybody else lurking around. Now, she did say to the police, oh, yeah, a couple of weeks ago, somebody did this. We saw this guy a few weeks. She, she had people in the past, like, looking suspicious. But on that day, I'm surprised neither one of them said, I saw a guy run from the house. Neither one said that. Not a bit about anybody else being in the house, which is interesting because you think, did that not occur to you that that would be a smart thing to say? Um, but I just think she thought if she if they couldn't prove she did it, then she didn't do it as long as she didn't rat her out. Uh, so we have these, uh, by the way, there's another there's another story about the, the uh, was it prussic acid? Supposedly a shopkeeper said the day before she went and tried to buy this poison and he wouldn't sell it to her. And she claimed that the poison was for cleaning some seal skin stuff. Uh, and supposedly that doesn't even make sense. Um, he didn't give it to her, but the concept was she was gonna poison the family and that didn't come off for her. So, and I'm not sure how entirely accurate that story is. So. But could that be something that shows something? Yes, it can. Um, but let's get back to the scene. So we have these two women. The, the, the first thing that happens is the stepmother gets killed up in the, up in the bedroom. Uh, where is she while this is happening? She's out washing windows. Now, either, there's the two possibilities, either... She went out to wash windows and she claims that she did not tell her to go wash the windows, but that is what she claims. And we don't know that it's not true. She says, I was out washing windows. And so meanwhile, she's upstairs, if it's her, killing stepmother. Um, and then she comes back, she comes back in and time goes on. We're talking about at least an hour. So now they're all moving around the house again. And some reason she never looks in that room and sees the body laying on the floor. The door is never closed. And then daddy comes home. Daddy is locked out of the house. And so he has to, he's trying to get in. She goes down to let in dad. Okay. 
Now, Mr. Borden, she opens the door to Mr. Borden. She claims at this time in one of her testimonies that she is upstairs on the landing, which is where the body of, she could see the body of her stepmother and supposedly hears her laugh. Why is she laughing? We don't know. That's what her claim is. Later on, she claims she was in the kitchen at the time. And then she changes her mind a few times. So she has trouble with her story. Anyway, so she lets in daddy. Now we have the stories diverge. So dad comes in and supposedly goes and ends up in the sitting room. First, he goes to the dining room. That's a long story there. He ends up in the sitting room, which is where he ends up dead on the couch. She claims that after she let the father in, that she went about doing different things. And then Lizzie came and talked to her. Uh, she heard Lizzie tell her dad that the stepmother was out because the stepmom had gotten some note that said someone was sick. So she had gone out and nobody saw she came back. So the assumption was she was out. Uh, and then she talked to her again about the note. And then they talked about a couple other things. And then she went upstairs to her bedroom and took a, to take a nap. Apparently a lot of people need naps. And so, and you know, servants definitely, you know, they get to have a nap in the middle of the day. But anyway, she goes up to take, she's up to her room to take a little rest. And while she's up in the room and Lizzie apparently walks out away from her father, because she said her father had sat down, took, took off his boots, which were on his feet in the picture. Um, and uh, so the con the concept that he's going to take a little nap, you know, did he take off? Did he? This, so here's the picture of him. Where's the boot picture? Um, yeah, he still got boots on. Um, so the the question is: Was was she lying about that, um, or that she wasn't even in the room when he did any of these things? And you know, who knows what happened? There's a whole bunch of stories, and none of them really matter. Here's what here's what does matter. She supposedly talked to Daddy. She supposedly, according to According to Bridget, they, she was, Bridget saw the dad, went in and out of the room. She talked to her, blah, 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 all things going on. And then she went up, took a nap. Lizzie says that once she opened the door to her father, she didn't see Lizzie again. That's a, two different stories. Where Now she says she never saw Lizzie again. She went, and talk, she went and talked to her dad. And then she left the room. And she went out to the barn. Those pigeons were murdered. She went out to the barn to look for some lead for some fishing things which there's no reason for because she hasn't about, have, ever had them out in the barn before. And then why was she out in the barn for 20 minutes? They asked her, oh, because she was eating a bunch of peaches she found on the ground. So she sat up in the hot and sweltering barn eating peaches while her daddy was being murdered. So then she came back into the house, walked in there and went, oh my God, daddy's dead. And then she yells for Bridget and says, come down quick, dad's been killed. No, 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 no he, he's been, he's been, he, no, no, she didn't even say he's been killed. He's been harmed. And then she told her to go get the doctor down the street. Now, so we have two different stories. There's a lot of interaction between the two of them and the father when she's telling the story. According to her, she never saw her after the after she let the father in, she just vanished, went up to her room. So we have a bunch of interesting things here. At two times during this day, she is not around for the times of the murders. One, she's outside washing windows, and then, amazingly enough, during that little few, five, ten minute period, she suddenly zips up to her room when the man gets killed. So did she just try to get her out of the house at those times? Say, hey, hey, hey Bridget, go outside and wash windows. Did she say, why don't you take a nap? You know, we don't know the exact story, but here's the problem. If, if, she, if she's just trying to manipulate her, why is the door open to the stepmother's room? Why is she running around the house all day long where she can run into these things and see these things? Or is what she's actually saying is, go wash the windows now. And then she goes and washes the windows. She comes back. And then there's a period of time after stepmom has been murdered that there's time to clean up all kinds of things because she's not in the dark about this. Then later on, it's time. Dad's coming home. Let him in. And then dad comes in. She goes, he says a few things. Go to your room. She goes to her room and takes care of that. And then it's like, come down. Dad's been hurt. And then sends her out. Now, again, we don't know. She get, They give time frames, but we don't know if these two are in collusion. 
there we don't know exactly how much time passed in between certain things. That's why people say, well, you know, she found her father dead and then she sends her to get the doctor. And how much time would she have to remove her clothes and get out rid of the blood? We don't know that these things actually happened at the times that anybody said they did. There may have been another 30 minute period of time that was useful to getting rid of certain evidence. Um, there's a claim that the father uh, had his, his uh, raincoat or whatever underneath his head, his coat under his head. And some people think that she, when he came in, he put that coat down or hung it up and she just put the coat over and then hacked him and then took the coat off and put it under his head because there was a lot of blood then anyway. So sticking it there would, you know, she wouldn't have to change. Uh, there was a story that uh, the day after she was burning up a, a, a dress in the stove, which later on her friend and she said, well, that was probably a stupid idea, but it had paint on it. So I wanted to get rid of it. Of course, you picked the day after a murder to get rid of a, a dress with paint on it. Why would you do that? The paint was not bothering you for the last three or four or six months. Suddenly it bothers you enough to burn your dress up in, in, in the stove. And then the, you can ask this question. If, if, the, the, if the outfit, is one, somebody said that she just, like they're painting something and I don't even have any evidence that they're painting red in the hallway, but yet she brushed against it. Well, you know, if you brush against it, it's just on one arm. You have a, a, a very expensive dress with all the materials and buttons. You don't burn that crap up. You remove the arm thing. You might replace the arm or you might take all those pieces of the clothes and make it into something else. You wouldn't just throw the whole dress away. That's ridiculous. So it is believed that that dress was used. Uh, some people believe she was running around naked killing people. She could have been. They, that was a similar claim in the uh, Julia Wallace murder I analyzed last week. Um, that you're naked and that way you can just wash off really easily and then put a new outfit on. Possible. But these two were the only people in the house. She was always not a, always missing in action at the time the murders occurred, but she was always racing around all the rest of the time. Their stories don't match exactly. Uh, so that's problematic. Um, and she got a lot of money that she went and bought a farm afterwards with. <laughs> I have a hard time saying she had no clue and that she would commit this crime. She killed two people in her own house with her maid running all over the place. That is to, to me ludicrous. And, and always another thing's interesting after, after she found her father Ill, harmed, injured, she didn't actually, she said there was blood there. She didn't go and check him out. She didn't get close to him. She just found him injured. She yells for her to go get the doctor down the street. But if you just found, if you just walk, if your father came home just a couple, like 10 minutes ago, and you, you, walk, you went out of the room, you came back and found him dead, would you not think the killer was still in the house? Would you not want to get the hell out of that house? I would be screaming, get out of the house to everybody and run out that door. But she didn't do that because she wasn't worried about a killer being in the house. Well, because she knew who the killer was <laughs> and it wasn't going to be somebody who was going to harm her. Uh, another thing that's interesting, supposedly she had said to the father and she, uh, she agrees with this, that the, the stepmother supposedly was not at home because a stepmother had earlier gotten a note that said someone was sick and she would go attend to her. So they supposedly thought the stepmother had left the house, you see, never seeing, uh, you know, some, and that's why when she was murdered upstairs, they had no idea she was murdered because she was not even supposed to be home. But they never heard her return either. And the door was locked. So how, would, how did she even get into the house without anybody knowing it to go upstairs and get killed? That makes no sense. And on top of it, later on, she tries to cover this and goes, I think maybe I did hear her come in. <laughs> sure. Because now you have to have her come in later and get killed later. So you get a whole bunch of nonsense here. But the things that stick out to me are only two people in the house for more than just a five minutes in time. Five minutes in time, somebody can come in and out. They were the only two people in the house over a period of hours. And neither one saw anything in spite of the fact they were moving around a lot. She was always conveniently not in sight of the person being murdered at the time they were being murdered. But yet she was there right afterwards. So she would have to think that she's trying to get rid of the weapon. She's trying to get rid of clothing. She has to know something. Uh, that door opened upstairs in the mother's uh, the stepmother's bed, the stepmother, the room stepmother was working in being left open means to me, she knew that didn't matter if she saw, uh, because she already knew what was going on. Um, everything. Everything points to 
her, her being the killer and she being an accomplice um, for the money. And after, after interesting thing here too, after the murders that she was, she was, she was acquitted. Um, she and her sister got like, what is it? Today's money, like $4 million each. And they moved to, she, she bought this, she bought this fancy, fancy, schmancy house and which you can still see also up there. Um, and they moved in together. And then she started doing parties with theater people and all stuff. And then at some point there was this argument, something happened between the two of them. Some people claim it's just that she didn't like the lifestyle she was leading. She was having a hate. She, she loved the way she was living now. She had her fancy clothes. She had her fancy house. She had her fancy friends. She was loving life. She was more, a little bit more of a, more like her dad, I think. Uh, so some people say, well, she just didn't like her lifestyle and that she had some interest in one of the actresses, maybe that offended her or whatever. And so she left. I don't believe it for a minute. When they, when they, when they split ways, she never talked to her sister again. Now, this is a girl that raised her little sister for 10 years who tried to be to try to say she didn't kill the parents. I believe she found out, figured out that she did indeed murder her father and the stepmother. And that's why she went away and never spoke to her again. Had to be something major, in my opinion, because they didn't have a lot of relatives here. It wasn't like they had each other. Their mother was dead. Now their father and stepmother are dead. They only had each other and she's willing to just cut a relationship off completely for the rest of her life. I'm going to say she, she found out something and, or she realized something finally going, wait a minute here. So do I think Lizzie Borden killed her parents? Absolutely. Uh, that she burned up her dress, that she managed to get, either they, they, they did find that hatchet. Um, they did find a hatchet, uh, that was broken and, and there was supposedly some like, and they couldn't figure out whether that was used or not. They thought it matched the wounds. Um, some people think that flat iron that she had that she couldn't seem to ever get her clothes ironed with. She was ironing, no, she was ironing handkerchief, but it was always like not warm enough. And supposedly some people think that's what she used to whack them. Uh, I, I don't know. Some say that the, the, the cuts, the, the, the cuts and materials and things all match this. I, I don't know. I, I, I'm not absolutely sure. What I am absolutely sure is that they never could prove exactly what the weapon was. So either they already had the weapon or they were looking at the wrong weapon or she got rid of the weapon. And she did send out, you know, she, she did send her down the street. So who knows? She could have wrapped it up and somebody said, dump this along the way. She could have, she, maybe she knows what the weapon is. Um, and then she burned up her dress. I don't know if that's the dress she used. And interestingly enough, she could have used the same dress dress for both crimes. If she was in on it and then she whacked up the, the stepmother, it depends how she whacked her up as how much blood would get on her clothes. Uh, she may have had some blood on her clothes that just dried. It wasn't all over the floor or anything. And she just kept that on. And when her dad came home and there's all this story about how she had this, you know, she was in now that room conversations or whatever, maybe that never happened. Maybe she let the dad in. The dad went into the sitting room, sat down, was looking at you know, laid back and she just looked around the corner and, said, and just went and whacked him. And then she just took the dress off and got, you know, hit it and then burn it up the next day. We'll never know, but there was nobody else in that house but these two. And I'm going to say she's the murderer and she's the accomplice. Um, and uh, I'll stand by that one because there's nothing else to make any sense to me. I'm going to go to your comments now, which are so surprisingly so many. Uh, let's see. Oh, that's a good question. I like it. I wonder if Emma was scared of Lizzie. She may have been. She may have realized that something's not right with her sister. She may have even before this realized something wasn't quite right with her sister. Abby, the stepmother, may have also had concerns about her. She was an adult and she might have, Abby may have felt uncomfortable around her as well because she didn't, you know, she got that. When people are a psychopath, one of the things people say about living around psychopaths is, is they're confusing. They're very confusing. And they sometimes you, you say, say one thing and then they do something different and you just don't understand what's going on with them. Never makes quite sense. And they also have that dead look in their eyes. So it's like they creep you out with the uh, snake eyes or what do you put us? What's the other word for those? Um, oh, I forgot what they are called. Um, but you know, that, that just something not right about that person It makes you very uncomfortable. So yeah, I, um, uh, her sister may have just gotten to the point where she's like, I don't really want to be around her. 
Now, she made out well because she just got the money. <laughs> she, she went away. She ended up getting married and living the rest of her life. And supposedly somewhere near her death that she alluded to some things. But again, I don't know the, the validity of that. Um, well, that's a good point. Uh, Stephanie says, I think they're all scared of Lizzie. People and families with a member that's psychopath usually are. That's a good point. Um, uh, Lizzie and her issues ran that house, in my humble opinion, and may be true, too. She was uh, probably very, very, uh, and she tried to blame everybody else for things, but I think I think she may have been very controlling, very controlling. And she may have been very controlling of her, too. And she began to believe her life depended on her. What, what was going to happen in the future depended on her. And if she and if she crossed her, what would happen to her? That kind of thing. So, yeah. Empty, scary eyes. Yes. Um, what's your theory that Andrew had his shirts and boots on, which is unusual for that time? Okay. So the the I can't quite tell with it. Uh, you know, I would probably have to do another 20, 20 hours worth of research on this, Benny. Um, he had his shoes on in the parlor, and the theory is he comes home to get comfortable at home. Uh, he would take his shoes off and put his slippers on in the house. Now, I personally am a person who doesn't wear shoes in houses. I often go to people's houses and take my shoes off and they think I'm crazy. But I spend a lot of time around Indian homes. <laughs> and so I have a lot of friends from India and nobody wears their shoes in the house. So it's a very Indian thing. I don't really know that time whether they all had some slippers they put on when they came in the door. And therefore the shoes should be by the door when they proceed. Or whether that wasn't exactly true or wasn't exactly true for him. He was found with the shoes on. So the question is, did he sit down? And supposedly he had his eyes closed, and that's why he got like a whack through the head. And one of the people asked her if they saw his eye hanging out of his head, and she said, no, I didn't see that. Anyway, um, you think you'd notice that. Um, but anyway, uh, did he, Did he? you know, when the people say he had his eyes shut and he was there for sleeping, <laughs> Just because the axe hits you when your eyes are shut doesn't mean you're sleeping because I'm pretty sure if somebody's about to whack me in the face with a, with a, the, the natural response is this. So I, I don't know that the fact his eyes were closed when he got hit means he was sleeping. So was he just looking at his newspaper when he got hit? Was he just sitting down and getting comfortable? I don't know. He had his shoes on. That's all I know. Um, some people say that I've heard that they put, you know, he had his slippers on, but the police came in and put his shoes on because it was more pro proper. I, I don't, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but I don't know. I really don't know. All I know is man comes home, these people are in the house and within what, 15 minutes, he ends up dead in his own home. So unless somebody came in right after him and hacked him up, I just waited. Well, where can, where's that person going to find these two women out of the room for sure? How would you know that? You know, okay, I see, I see Mr. Mr. Borden's going into the house now. I'm waiting here with my axe. Unless you were actually literally in the house hiding behind a piece of furniture. How would you know that these women weren't going to be in the room? Or, and then why would you just kill them too? You already killed two people. You might as well kill another one. I, I think the, I, I'm surprised she didn't kill her, but, you know, maybe she didn't because then she'd be the only one left standing. <laughs> and she was kind of her alibi. So... Yeah, I, 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 that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. No. Um, do I have an opinion on the number of blows? It's often claimed to be a rage killing or overkill. Um, I think that the overkill thing and the rage thing, and usually the people that said that the person who does that knows the person they're killing, and that's why they do that. But I've seen serial killers stab up somebody 50 times. Uh, you either do it because you are angry, you do it because it's fun, or you do it because you want to make damn sure they're dead. Or a combination of all three. I do not get into the heads of a killer. And some profiles will claim they do. They're, they're full of it. You're not a psychic. <laughs> and, and psychics aren't real anyway. So, <laughs> so um, no, I don't get into the mind of the killer. I don't know what he's thinking at that time. Or she's thinking at that time. Sometimes they just do things because it amuses them. Because they felt like it. I don't know. All I know is somebody... Made sure they were dead. <laughs> um, oh, thank you. Eric Berry, very good question. Did he have defensive wounds? Mm, oh, shoot. I know she didn't have defensive wounds, the, the stepmother. Um, and defensive wounds, again, are all depending. Here we go. We got these issues again. All right. 
People have defensive wounds when they see it coming. People don't have defensive wounds when they don't see it coming. They Do they have time is the question. Um, if they turn around and they see somebody that they don't think is going to kill them standing there with an ax, they might go, are you going to go cut some wood? <laughs> you don't have defensive wounds. Or the person standing behind them, now with, with, with the stepmother, they thought it is possible that she, stepmother was leaning over at the bed and she whacked her on the head first, basically knocking her out or knocking her over and then whack, 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 whack. Um, I don't know because I can't really see the proper autopsy stuff to know which way I'd go with that. And the, all the crime scene photos, I don't have them. Uh, so I don't know. Um, or, or she could have just snuck up behind her and said, Mrs. Borden, and Mrs. Borden goes, what? And boom, you know, you don't have defensive wounds. Dad um, could have been reading a newspaper and she came up behind the newspaper and just the ax came over the top of the newspaper and all he could do was shut his eyes. I have no idea, uh, but I don't know about that. I forgot about the defensive wounds on him. So if anybody knows, let me know. Um, not sure. Um, if you, so, yes, this is, this is, this is what you might do if you had the time to do it. And this is where we, we can't, can't over exaggerate things because we don't know. As I said, if somebody, you see somebody raising an ax, yeah, you probably do this. You definitely, I mean, you wouldn't just close your eyes and go, you'd go like, you you'd go like this, probably close your eyes and do that. But what if you didn't see them doing this? What if by the time you looked up, it was already coming down? You don't have time. You went, maybe you went like this, but never got there. See, this is where you can't over, over analyze something that you can't possibly know the answer to. And I try not to do that because, I mean, sometimes people do that. Like, well, a little, little, little. I don't know. I wasn't there. I don't exactly know the entire movements of everybody. And therefore, I can tell you they ended up dead, <laughs> you know, but I can't tell you the exact order of everything. Now, sometimes I can. There, is, there are crimes which I have been able to analyze, like like the, like the superbike murders um, in South Carolina. I was able to or actually determine the exact order of everybody's being shot and the exact order of how the guy was shooting the gun and when he changed out of the magazine and what was in the magazine and how he shot it. I could actually go through the whole thing if you look at that crime because I had evidence. I had evidence of which bullet was hit where, which bullets missed. I, I had a lot of evidence. In this case, I don't have the evidence to even, even you know, think about it. Um, ha, the old... Uh, Yes, I, <laughs> I have been thinking about that one. Uh, I, I, that's been asked a bunch of times, um, and I can't even pronounce that. Hinter, Hinterkaifen. Am I correct? Hinterkaifen. Um, that is a fascinating case, and it's really difficult to analyze and figure out. So I haven't reached a point where I won't look like an idiot if I do that particular video yet. <laughs> So I keep, I keep some, some cases I've got on a list. I go back and keep reviewing them and going, okay, what am I missing? What information do I know? Uh, before I do this show on it, I, I got to make sure that I can actually analyze it properly. Um, if I can't, it's just an interesting story that, you know, maybe there's just not enough evidence to, to be able to make a determination. Sometimes also the evidence, there's so too much evidence. In other words, people have all kinds of information that you can't even verify. And when you can't verify stuff, that's why I don't go big into the whole family who's, who doesn't like whom, you know, because I can't verify all of that. And therefore, I don't know. Uh, so the, with that murder, there's a lot of, lot of, there's a lot of bizarre things in that murder of incest and people getting pregnant and the bad neighbor. There's so much. I just don't know if I can determine what's true and what's not true in order to then be able to analyze the crime. It's a tough one. Um, well, Pat did that without being a psychic. <laughs> I'm not sure that, what that means, but oh, good. Um, <laughs> let's see. Um, uh, I, I, I do not know. I don't know if that was an idea she had. 
And that's that that was something the prosecution claimed. Um, I still am not absolutely sure it was her, although it seems like it was her. Uh, seems like a strange story. I don't know that. Yeah. Um, I personally think that if it, she would send her over to do that. But anyway, to pick up the poison. But um, could she have done that thinking, OK, I could get this and I could kill them when I have an opportunity. And now she's like, whoa, I got this opportunity. My sister's away and, and the uncle's off. I, you know, I believe it's premeditated homicide premeditated homicides. I just don't, the question is, was it, I don't think it just cropped up that day. Some people, oh, some people think this, that, oh, here's another story. So supposedly this is, this is a theory. I think actually Ed McBain came up with this theory. Ed McBain is a writer. Um, and is a, there's a series called the 87th precinct. I read these 30 years ago. I loved them. And I don't love very many crime stuff, but he writes the 87th precinct, which is a place procedural mystery stories. I love his, loved his stuff. At least I did back then. So Ed McBain has this wild ass theory. And I'm just like, you've just gone off the deep end on this one. But anyway, some of the, I can't, I think it's his theory, um, but other people have pr proposed it as well, that these two were having an affair and they were in bed together. Uh, and the, the stepmother walked in and saw them having sex or snuggling up or whatever and got, all freaked out and angry and furious. And so she killed the stepmother. So she wouldn't tell or because she saw them or whatever, whatever. But, you know, it would be odd that stepmother would be in that room getting whacked because then where did she get this hatchet from? I mean, she'd have to leave the room, go find a hatchet, come back. And I don't think stepmommy is going to hang around in there. Um, so there should be a chase to the house or something. And then suppose after she knocks off stepmommy and these two are in it together because obviously they're lovers. Then daddy comes home and she goes and tells dad that what happened. And then dad doesn't like it either. So she kills dad. I don't think so. I think she's all about the money. I do. I, could they have had a relationship and that could be why she could control her more possibly. I mean, you know, she's, she, she wasn't, she didn't have any boyfriends. She didn't seem to have many boyfriends at the time. They're both in the house together. They're both similar age. Maybe they had a little thing going. So maybe she liked her. And maybe one day she said, you know, can't live like this anymore. Uh, you can't live with the parents. That they're, they're horrible people. And, and I'm, I'm going to take care of that. And I'm going to give you some money so you can have a better life. I don't know. We can only, that's what you call theory. That's not a proven theory. I think what's, what to me, I can prove in this case, or let me put it this way. If I were on that jury, which, which I wouldn't have been allowed because I'd be female at the time. <laughs> but let's say they had females on the jury and I was there. I think the circumstantial case is strong enough for conviction. Now, sometimes circumstantial cases aren't. No, no, no weapon, no blood on her. But she's burning up dresses. She's the only one in the house along with her. Um, I, I think I would have convicted her. Um, but could I prove exactly why she did it? I would say it's for the money. And that would, if I were the prosecution, I'd be pushing that. Because the other story is 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 too, you know, uh, like it wasn't planned. And it'll be really odd. I mean, it could have happened. It could have happened. Can't say it didn't. Just don't buy it. But it could have happened. <laughs> so maybe I'm wrong on that. Maybe that was the reason. Maybe that was the motive. Uh, but the fact that if she was buying prussic acid and she was already after the money issue, it seems like she was already in a premeditative stage. And I also find a little bit odd that they would have been caught by the stepmother in bed together um, because there are a lot of locking doors there. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, at that time in history, Jill says, wouldn't she have married if only her motive was to get out of the house? Not if you had to marry some guy you didn't want to marry, but didn't have enough money. I mean, you know, not everybody wants to just marry for that purpose, especially, you know, she, she, yeah. I mean, people did marry to get out of the house, but it doesn't mean they always did it. Um, let's see. Um, well, she, one of the things, Clarissa, I think you're right about is that right after this hell happened, she, her lifestyle changed tremendously. Now, one, is that a motive? Because she wanted to change her lifestyle. And I don't know that that's absolutely something you can say is true or not. 
Um, let's say, I'm trying to think of a good example here. Um, let's say, yeah, let's say I got married and uh, the fellow I married had a reasonable amount of money and he was already older and and he he had enough money, which would be worth me, let's say, let's say, let's say it was worth a million dollars. Let's say that's not why I married him, it's for his money. But we were living together and, and having a seemingly pleasant life. And then one day he's murdered. And after he's murdered, I get the money. Now, I've lived a pleasant life with him. Let's say I'm living in a house like this, but I get a million dollars and I say, you know, I never loved this house. And now I've got a million dollars. I never expected to have a million dollars that I could spend all of my own. You know, I didn't have to share it with anybody. I didn't have to get permission. But now I got a million dollars. Okay. I want to get a prettier house. I want to, I want to get something I want. So I get that. And everybody goes, oh, she killed him for that. So I don't say, I don't know that you can say one, that, that one thing caused the other thing. I don't know if that is a cause and effect. Thing. I think it just could have, have come after. But then again, that could have been exactly the motive. She killed him because she wanted the money and she didn't want to wait and she didn't want him to go to her stepmother. I think personally, I think that's true, but can I prove it? No, I can't. So <laughs> the pigeons did it. <laughs> they were pissed at him. Yeah, those pigeons. <laughs> yeah, she was at the old maid age at that, unfortunately. Pretty sad. Um, oh, here's a good point. A lot of women want to avoid the risk of childbirth and Lizzie was privileged enough and wealthy enough to stay unmarried. That is also true. She, she had an income from her father. She, she actually won. So as awful as her father was, apparently she went on a European tour um, and she seemed to have decent enough clothes. She wasn't like dressed crappily. Although, interestingly enough, uh, supposedly one of the police officers who think she was involved, uh, the detectives, said that he, when he met her, she was very humble and wearing a humble outfit. But after she showed up at the trial, she was much better dressed. So I guess she had the money in hand at that point. Um, so oh, that's kind of interesting. Um, um, oh, that's interesting. I think Lizzie's trip through Europe was potentially the catalyst for the dissatisfaction she had with her lifestyle at home. Could be. And, you know, you know living in your... If, if you have, if your parents and were, were living modestly, and they were in comparison to how much money they had, they could have moved to the house that she moved to. They could have a much bigger house, more servants, and lived a higher society life. They could have. I think her father just wasn't interested. It wasn't his thing. He didn't want to be in high society. I mean, I have the same thing. If I had, a, if I truly, if I had a, somebody just said, here's, here's $10 million. I don't really want to hobnob with the Hollywood folk. It's not, I'm not interested in that. I, 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 I'm, I'm not a high society person. So I have no, and I don't really desire a huge house with fancy crap in it. It just, just it's not me. So I might, let's say I got that $10 million and, and my kids were like, geez, my we're spending the money, you know? Well, if we each had three, three and a half million dollars, we could do a lot with it. <laughs> Which is why you never, never let your children know how much money you have. They might get rid of you. <laughs> Oh, they might get rid of you. Um, let me see if any other comments in here. Um, okay, this is an interesting question. I wonder what would have happened if the father didn't stay downstairs when he came home. Lizzie wouldn't have been able to sneak up on him. Did she suggest he take a rest? Hmm. We will never know. So a lot of what we hear happen is only coming from these two because they're the only ones there. We have no idea what was actually said. Come, father, sit down. Let me take, you know, that kind of thing. She claimed he took his shoes off and could put his slippers on, which wasn't true. So I don't know when she went into the room. Maybe because she was wearing the bloody dress from, from stepmom. Who knows? Maybe she was the one that was in the room and now she claims she wasn't. I don't know. I don't know how much time they had to get the stories together. They don't exactly match. But they're, they're not the greatest stories either. But, yeah, um, what if, I mean, the dad may have had a routine that he, he stuck with pretty much. Um, there was a long way to his bedroom on the other side of the house, uh, but let's say he did go there. Uh, she could have, you know, snuck around and got him there too. So, you know, I think when people plan crimes, they go with what they think should happen and, uh, and people's normal behaviors and routines. And if they're correct, they win. And if they're not correct, 
sometimes all hell breaks loose and everything goes wrong and it's a big fat mess. So sometimes you will see scenes that you go, what in the world? And it's because it didn't go as planned. So, um, uh, did, uh, did you, Lizzie benefit from male jurors disbelief a woman could have committed the crime? I think so. She was not a high society lady, but she was a woman of means. And she came in and she dressed very nicely and she just looked demure. And I think they, yeah, I think they could not fathom her killing both of them. And in spite of, and because they didn't have the, they didn't have the weapon and they didn't have blood on her specifically. I think they thought, well, maybe somebody else was there. And again, all it takes is somebody thinking, you know, maybe I'm wrong. No, it's easy for us here. I'll say this. I'll th say this very, very clearly. I'm sitting here today saying, I believe she's guilty. And I'm saying, if I were on that jury, I would say, I would find her guilty. But I'm not on that jury. I'm not. Let's say I really was on that jury. And I'm looking at her little face. And I'm thinking to myself, as a layperson, especially, I'm not going to be a profiler. I'll be a layperson. And I'm thinking, I think she did it, but... What if I am wrong? Because you are playing God when you sit in the jury booth. You are playing God. And what if I am wrong? I'm I'm she's going to be hung. She will be hung in the gallows. I will be one who is killing her. If I say she's guilty, I am killing her. And that's the truth. To today, it's the same problem we have with, with civilian juries. Because effectively, when you say the person, you find them guilty, you are putting them in prison for the rest of their life. If I'm talking about homicides, putting them in prison for the rest of their lives, taking away their life. What if they're innocent? And instead of going home to their family, they're going to spend 30 years in prison before the Innocence Project comes along and frees them. If they were innocent, right? And then you feel like, oh my God, I've ruined that person's life. Can I imagine if that would happen to me? What if they're completely innocent? I give them that it's a death penalty. And I am the one who kills them because every person who said they're guilty on that jury is effectively the executioner. It's just because we're not there at the very day that somebody actually put, you know, puts the needle in their arm or pushes a button. Doesn't matter if you are on the jury and you found them guilty, you are executing them if it's a death penalty case. And that puts you in a really different position than sitting here in my, in, in my dining room slash office <laughs> doing YouTube. And I always go back to my favorite saying, one of my favorite sayings of all time, and then I'll wrap this up. It's from the book called The Autobiography of a Yogi. And the there's a yogi, a famous, famous yogi dude, and it's a student of the yogi. And the yogi is telling the fellow that you should never harm an animal. And never harm an animal. Don't eat an animal. Don't hurt an animal. Don't kill an animal. And the student says, but what if there was a cobra in front of you? And the yogi says, well, what about a cobra? Well, I wouldn't kill a cobra either. And he goes, but of course, there isn't a cobra in front of me right now. Exactly. It's easy to say these things when you are not the actual, you're not in the actual situation. Uh, so when I go for a professional jury over a, uh, uh, a civilian jury. On one hand, I think this would be better as far as being able to analyze the crimes and not put the pressure of making choices of life and death on regular citizens. To regular citizens who, you know, they're, 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 they're trying to live their lives. They're trying to raise their families and earn a living. And suddenly they're brought into a situation where they have to pronounce life or death on somebody. And based on the fact that they know very little about how to analyze anything. And so it's really cruel. I mean, I think it's exceptionally cruel. So a professional jury, I think, would at least have the abilities, like myself, if I were on a professional jury, I think at least with the other jury members, whether it be five people or seven or three or whatever it is, we all as professionals have the skill level to determine, to do better determinations. However, it will still be in our hands to be the executioner or not. And so then you have to ask yourself, even as a professional, how do you, how do you deal with that? It's kind of like, you know, the, the guy who, you know, the, that commit, you know, is the literal executioner, the hangman or, or whatever. How does he feel killing somebody? Because in a sense, that's what you're doing. So, you know, I mean, you definitely are doing it if you're a hangman. And they have these methodologies now where like 
Nobody knows. Like 10 people shoot a gun and only one of them has a bullet in it. Eh. You know, you're all going like this. You're all willing to kill. So, I mean, it's like, how stupid is that? But that way you don't feel as bad because one of the other people actually shot him. <laughs> you know, this whole, this is why people have had such difficulties. And I don't want to get into political stuff here, but I mean, it's a, it's a human thing. The, the issues of death penalties and, and um, why we're for or against them. But, but, but in reality, the same thing is true with the jury system. When you're on that jury, you are actually playing God with that person's life. And if you don't even have any skills to do it, you're even more concerned that you're going to make a big fat mistake. Uh, and, and all you have to do is say that reasonable doubt doesn't even have to be reasonable. That shadow of a doubt that's not supposed to be the way it's said is enough for a lot of people. The tiniest, tiniest grain of a doubt, like it just maybe somebody truly was hiding in a closet. Maybe enough. And those 10 men were like, we can't, we, 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 we would not feel good watching this woman, this woman hang. And we don't even absolutely know she did. Anyway, that was my, my soapbox speech at the end of the show. <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. All right. Now I'm hungry. So I want to go make my dinner. Uh, Lord. Um, so. <laughs> well, that's an interesting point, Benny. Jury members could very well be psychopaths themselves. And that's true, whether it's civilian or, or, or um, professional. You know, even, uh, yeah, it, it, either way. That, that One of the problems we have is who, you know, what is the, the, the mental, uh, emotional, and, and um, analytical abilities of the people there? Uh, who are they? Who are these people you dragged off that bus stop? I have the 12 people off a bus stop. That's why I say you get 12 people off a bus stop. You don't know. You know, they don't, they don't spend tons of time analyzing the entire life of this person to see whether they're like the most perfect jury member ever. It's, it's, it's a, now, sometimes they do background, there's certain background things, but it's, it's, it's short uh, and because and, they don't have that much time. And it becomes a big fat game between the, the prosecution and the defense. Um, so it's 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 kind of a mess so i think we've got a lot of fixing in the, the u.s jury system uh, but um nobody seems to want to even look at it which is fascinating to me um it just goes on and on and on and stays the same and no matter what everybody seems to think it's the best thing ever like oh my god it's the you know, best system in the world i'm thinking they, to me it just makes no logical sense at all but for so, like 10 different reasons, but that's me. And um, I've been fighting that for like 30 years. So, and I'm not getting anywhere. <laughs> Maybe after I die, uh, 30 more years from now, somebody will come and say, that Pat Brown has some great ideas. <laughs> or they'll just not use my name and just say, I have some great ideas. <laughs> uh, thank you, Benny. Thank you for a great show as usual. The point about the open door is a very important piece of evidence. And that really was Benny. The thing that really stuck out to me, and as I point out with a lot of these cases, it's that one or two things that I go, that strikes me as something that I can't get around. I can't get around this. I can't get around the open door. It makes no sense. If it had been the last crime committed, you know, uh, in the sense that it was like right before everything happened, maybe, but right to leave the door open for an hour and a half after you killed the person. Something's fishy there. <laughs> Something's fishy. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Love how logical and straight down the line you are. Thank you very much. I try, but you know, I mean, um, uh, people have, I say there's always different opinions and it's always worth listening to them, but, but always when you're listening, look for whether they're basing things on evidence and logic, because that's the two things that every detector and profiler needs evidence and logic. And so does the jury need evidence and logic. And the so detectives, profilers, juries, all need that. And of course, in our regular lives, evidence and logic <laughs> is very useful as well, because sometimes we misinterpret evidence, don't use logic, and we screw things up. And that can happen professionally, it can happen, uh, you know, just uh, in everyday life. So <laughs> my problem with researching cases, I think I'm Alice and I tumble into those rabbit holes. Well, people get you into those rabbit holes. So that's not your, that's not what you're doing wrong. What's happening is I say a lot of things on the internet, 
authors and so on and so forth, they make money off of the rabbit hole. They make a lot more money off of the rabbit hole than just having doing a basic thing and being looking at the evidence and analyzing it clearly because there is no rabbit hole then and you only get one one video out of it and you can't get people all into it and if you're going to write a book you know my book would be like this short <laughs> you want to write a book you got to come up with some rabbit holes then you get that and then you get people going, oh my god that's so fascinating so a lot of times you're led down the rabbit hole and i find that unfortunate because i find it uh not honorable to to do that i mean if you really believe that that avenue is 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 the truth that's fine yeah but i just say to myself how often is it that people look to create rabbit holes because rabbit holes are financially useful you know always look as i say follow the money <laughs> follow, follow the money <laughs> <laughs> pick your rabbit holes or try not to be in any of them. There are really, most of them aren't every once in a while. There's that case where I'll go. It's so bizarre that there it's very hard to figure out. And there I understand a little bit more of a rabbit hole. But on the other hand, sometimes you stop before you go down the rabbit hole then because you don't have enough information to dig the rabbit hole. Okay. You just don't have it. And you, that's why I'm looking at the, the, the German case you're talking about. Oh, what's a German case, right? I'm not sure yet what to do with it because I won't, don't want to open up rabbit holes for people. If I can't, if there's not proper evidence for me to analyze this to some rational point, then I shouldn't even do the show. Because, I mean, you can always tell stories. Stories are, that's why some of the story channels do so well because they're actually not analyzing. They're just telling the story. You could tell that story and it'd be fascinating. And then they'll, the person is not necessarily making a rabbit hole. They're just telling the story one time and people are making up their own rabbit holes. <laughs> but uh, so I'm OK with that. They're telling the story. That's fine. Uh, but uh, when you if you're going to analyze certain things, I, I, I the, recently, for example, the uh, Nancy Ng case um, that I just did about the, the girl from California who went to Guatemala to Lake Atitlan and was last seen in a kayak and now it's assumed drowned. But now the family is saying they believe something else happened. Uh, everybody's lying and nobody's, you know, people are hiding and not telling the truth. Now, here's the problem. Her body hasn't been found. So there's that little questionable stuff there. But as I was pointing out, I said, the chances of her likely drowning are very strong in comparison to anything else. But if they don't find exactly what happened to her, I guarantee you, you're going to see YouTube channels doing 50 shows on this, just what happened to her. And they're going to come up with the most ludicrous theories you've ever heard. And she's going to be in sex trafficking. Her kidneys are being stolen and all kinds of stupid crap because, because there's not a, a definitive answer. And if, if there's not a de definitive answer, at least I want to point out what is most likely and rational and not, not dig a rabbit hole, you know, because just because I want to make a bunch of money. <laughs> so anyway, that's a theory. Uh, oh, oh, that's nice. A skill I need to learn. <laughs> well, sometimes we just have to realize that, it really, in the long run, is not something beneficial to us or or the case. It doesn't, you know, for most of us, as I point out, most of us aren't solving these cases anyway. So the concept that we're, we're making a huge difference for the family or for solving some unknown case from 70 years ago, we're not actually doing that. My whole point here is to teach so that future cases get solved better by the detectives, so that future profilers learn how to analyze better. For the future, because most time you can't go back that much in time. It's kind of like pretty much screwed. And that people in normal life can use some of these just uh, learning how to analyze and rash, you know, do things rationally and see what the evidence is, help them in a normal life. So you can say, should I be with that guy? Should I be with that girl? <laughs> Those simple things. Should I give money to that person? And th these things require analysis. Look at the evidence and say, what does the evidence tell me? And let me be logical about it. And then, you know, that, that, that is a very good, that is a very good thing to use this for. So I like to have this be uh, beneficial as opposed to just, you know, another channel that makes the, the, the YouTuber rich. <laughs> Although I wouldn't mind a little bit more. <laughs> uh, oh, Probably. Yeah, you're probably correct. And it's, it's so sad. Even if they do find her body, God knows what they'll say by then. Um, it's just, chances are she just, just, she just drowned. The only thing I really brought up on that case was that 
because it's a high drug area as far as drug usage goes among the people coming there, they're doing yoga, they're, they're trying to they get high on high on spirituality and life and drugs. Uh, and so I've been to Lake Atitlan twice. I know what goes on there, that it's possible that she could have been under the influence of something and, or she could have not been, but the other girl who was out there, they suppose they kind of went off on their own. And then supposedly she got out and went swimming. The other girl could have been high as hell, you know? And so what happens is she's not, act, she's not seeing things properly. She wasn't able to react properly. Who knows? That's the only thing I think that makes any sense if it's just, you know, not something super simple. It might just be that some of the people involved may have been under the influence of something that prevented them from properly handling the situation. That's just a guess. I mean, I really don't know, but uh, unless they, something happened to her elsewhere and then they, you know, but there's too much evidence she went out on the boat. So I just, I can't even go there. So there you go. It just makes no sense, but yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, Nobody likes to accept these kind of things, Clarissa, because, you know, the hardest thing for a family is to accept their child that something stupid. You know, and I, when I say stupid, I just mean a bad choice. You drive too fast. You had one drink too many. You picked the wrong, you know, you just you decided to go hiking on a day that was too hot and you didn't bring enough water with you. You went to a jungle and you got lost. I mean, these kind of things, you just like, it's too it's too simple. It's too stupid. If, I, if something happens to my kid, I want it to be something major, not some momentary thing that they just didn't think about. And then they died because of it. But that's what a lot of death comes that way. And, and, and uh, teenagers and even adults, you know, even older people do some really stupid crap. And we've all done it. We've all done stupid crap. And you think, glad I didn't die that time. <laughs> so I've been there, done that. And I'm like, and that's what always scares you when you have your own children. The reason you're so frightened when they become teenagers is because you did stupid crap too. And you know you do stupid crap and you survived it. So now you're terrified your kids are going to do stupid crap and not survive it. That's why we, yeah, but that's why it's it's true. It's it's real. Uh, so anyway, okay, I got to go make my little dinner. And so I will be back for the, um, uh, for the, uh, hang out this week. And I think I have a couple other cases I'm probably just do as a video this week. Some things I want to talk about, but it doesn't require an entire live show. So I might get those out this week. So anyway, uh, thank you for all for being here. You're always great as usual. I prefer a live show over a regular video. I uh, just because I enjoy the company and your input and your friendship. So you're all great. <laughs> and like I've been in this house by myself all day long. It's so nice to have company. No. It's sad, isn't it? I know. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, thank you all for being here. It's This is a great, I'm glad you all forced me to do this case because I really wasn't thinking of doing it. Uh, and, you know, sometimes I just have to get myself to really look into it more to see if there's uh, evidence that really strikes me as being true evidence that I can do something with. And so it turned out this was one of those cases. So one more historical mystery solved. Hmm. Or at least I think so. Anyway, thank you for being here. I'll see you next time if you're new. Hey, do subscribe to the channel. Please helps out. Bye.